This is our last lecture of the semester, so we're going to cover chapter 12, which is called Comparative Cognition 2 Special Topics. And that basically means that we're going to spend this chapter talking about some of the really cool and very niche uh, concepts that tend to be covered by comparative cognition. This is by far one of my favorite chapters to look at, just because we're looking at some of the most interesting experiments, at least in my opinion, um, as we start looking at things like cognition in different species. So we're going to cover topics like, actually, I have a list of topics, topics like tool use, spatial memory, perceptual concept formation, language learning, and if we have time, we'll touch on timing and numerosity. If this was an in-person class, we would spend a lot of this class looking at different YouTube videos showing all of these cool abilities in different species. As I've mentioned before, I believe, with me recording my own videos and posting them to YouTube, I can't directly include other people's content for copyright reasons. So there's a whole bunch of links listed on our e-class, so I highly encourage you to take a look at some of those and maybe, you know, go down the YouTube rabbit hole and look at some other really interesting concepts um, and videos of tool use in particular is an interesting one, um, just if you have the time. But as the author of our textbook says, this list covered under special topics is not meant to be an exhaustive list of all of the things that fall under the category of co uh, comparative cognition. These are just the ones that are particularly of interest to us and to the author. There are all sorts of different niche areas of research that can be studied under comparative cognition, because as we've said repeatedly throughout this course, it's a very broad and diverse field. So with all of that out of the way, let's hop into our discussion about tool use. Like most of the topics we're going to cover today, tool use is a fairly controversial topic because there are some people who believe that tool use is sort of a unique cognitive ability that's only displayed by some species, whereas others view cases of supposed tool use as situations of just instrumental learning that has led to them being able to use these tools in a particular way. Um, Whichever side of that argument you might find yourself on, I still think that it's a very interesting ability, however these uh, animals might have arrived at that final point. So our first step here should be to define what we're talking about when we're talking about tools. So a tool would be a physical object that is used to obtain a goal. Usually these goals are things like obtaining food, um, but there are other instances in rarer cases. Mostly we're just going to be talking about obtaining food, um, but for some pretty iconic cases of tool use, we have lots of examples with different primates. <clears throat> pardon me, primates. Um, so things like fishing, as displayed in this image here, they also do really good at fishing termites out of termite mounds using different shaped blades of grass and sticks. There's a video for that up on our e-class. We're going to talk a lot about crows and specifically New Caledonian crows and their ability to use and make tools, specifically hooks, um, so hooked sticks that they can use to obtain food. Um, octopi have, sorry, octopuses is the correct plural, um, though both are acceptable. Um, they have been shown to carry around coconut shells that they can use as portable shelter. So this is a non-food related one, but they can use these shells that they drag with them to camouflage and look like a rock. One of the coolest ones that I just found out fairly recently is that there are a, a particular species of wasps that use pebbles. So these wasps will make their nest, they will lay their eggs on some dead or paralyzed caterpillars, cover them up with uh, some soil, and then go off and find a rock, the correct sized rock for their purpose, bring it back to their nest, and use that rock to pound the earth flat, um, compact it just enough to cover off the eggs so that when they grow they can dig through the dirt, um, but not uh, so compact that they can't dig through it in the future. And I don't know what it was about wasps knowing somehow to go and get a rock, but that one freaked me out a lot more than uh, some of the other instances of tool use we're going to talk about today. <clears throat> 
But I figured if I have to know, now you all have to know too. All right, so when we're looking at tool use, um, most of the research, most of the ongoing research has been in either primates or uh, New Caledonian crew. And that's because primates are very closely related to humans, and originally tool use was thought to be a human-specific skill. So over time, we are kind of expanding our definition and including more tool users. There's also a subcategory of tool use called proto-tool use, where it doesn't quite meet the definition for tool use, but it's close. Um, so this is a very, very quickly growing field. We're just going to hit some of the very highest of high points because we could teach an entire class on tool use and still not cover everything that we could talk about. Um, so for the next couple of slides, there are a few videos, again, linked on our e-class that you can take a look at. I've just included some stills here. These videos are coming from a paper by Bird and Emery, and they've done many, many, many different iterations of different kinds of tool using scenarios with their captive population of New Caledonian crows. So in this experiment here, we have sort of a clear plexiglass container setup. And the way that this would work is that there's actually a chute underneath. Again, you'll see it better in the video, but there's a tube at the top and the rest of the top of this box is kind of closed off. So there's food inside the box, but the crows can't get to it directly because the top of this apparatus is closed off. The only way to get at that food is through this tube at the top. And so the food is resting inside this clear plexiglass apparatus, sitting on an unstable ground, um, basically a flat plane. And if they could drop something on top of it, or if they could poke at it hard enough, they could dislodge the food and have it come out down the chute at the bottom so that they could then eat it. So these researchers would give these birds different tools that they could be using to get at that food. But you might notice here they've given them a rock that's too large to fit into this hole. Um, so they would vary whether they give them large rocks or small rocks and they tend to find that the birds learn which rocks will and will not fit into the tube, and they tend to ignore the larger rocks. Same thing with the sticks here. They'll give them sticks that are long enough to put down the tube and press that unstable uh, platform in order to dislodge the food, but some sticks will be too short. So again, the birds will stop uh, paying attention to the non-functional tools, the sticks that are too short to be of any use. So this is used as evidence that they understand what these tools are going to be used for and that they don't fit some criteria that would make them useful in this situation. So we have this uh, differential treatment whether a tool would be functional or non-functional, um, where they pay attention to things that have more function and they pay less attention to things that wouldn't be useful. The next part of this is tool modification. So instead of just giving these crows a uh, tool that's already set up and ready to go in their apparatus, they would give them uh, devices or tools or items or whatever that aren't quite suited to the task. So in this situation, they were given a stick, but the stick had lots and lots of branches coming off of it, which meant that it wouldn't fit into the tube. And so they found that these crows would actually break off the side branches to turn it into sort of one long, straight uh, piece of wood that they could then use for their task. Our next modification of this, um, we have uh, the same basic setup, so those clear plastic boxes like these guys here with the chute that the food can come out of. In the middle they have a mealworm on an unstable platform where if they could drop something it would drop down and dispense the mealworm down this chute. But they're only given a large rock. And then they're given two other places, so two other apparatuses with larger mouthed uh, tubes, so this large rock would fit into either of these tubes and they're given the choice, okay, well, would you like to drop this large rock into this uh, apparatus or this apparatus, the only two that it'll fit in? 
If they drop it into this one, they get another large rock, which isn't particularly helpful. But if they drop it into this one, they get a small rock. And that small rock will fit into the tube that gets them food. And they found that over time, the uh, crows would choose to put the large rock into the small rock container, dispensing the small rock, and then use the small rock to get the food. So this is called meta tool use because you need to use a tool to get another tool that will then allow you to get the food item. So there are tons of different modifications of this using crows, great apes, and other species um, where they're trying to show this sort of intentionality or this understanding of more than just the immediate task at hand. So the idea here is that they need to be able to think of the fact that to get to this, I need a small rock, which is over here. So to get this, then I need to take this large rock and put it in here. Then I need to take the small rock and put it in here, and then I get the worm. So if the crows were just putting rocks into devices that would fit rocks, then they'd have sort of an equal chance of picking the small rock or the large rock. But they do find that over time, they pretty consistently choose the smaller rock that will then be useful. Our last very, very brief talk pick for tool making comes with another video from YouTube. Um, so check out that link uh, for tool making. But this is a really fun experiment where they have, again, New Caledonian crows, just because they're so darn smart. And they have a fairly open mouthed or wide mouthed tube. And at the bottom, it's very, very difficult to see here but let's see if I can draw it a little bit clearer. There's basically the tube, and at the bottom, there's a bucket that has a little handle on top. And so it's down too far for the crow to reach with their beak. Their beak is very short, so it would only come down to about here. So their beak can't reach all the way down. It stops about this high, but they need to be able to get to this bucket handle in order to get the food that's at the bottom. And the food is usually mealworms because it's a really appetizing food for them. And so what happens is that in the general experiment, the crows would be given hooks. So pieces of metal wire with a hook on the end. And the crows would have to pick between, you know, a hook that kind of looks like this, which doesn't have anywhere that would grip on. So it's a non-functional tool. They would be given straight sticks. They'd be given sort of very, very curvy sticks. And they'd have to pick the best one for the task. The anecdotal uh, story of this from the researchers is that somebody forgot to give them sort of one, uh, a tool that would successfully get the bucket. So they didn't get this tool. What they got was a bunch of sort of straightish ones or non-functional ones. And one of the subjects, one of the crows, she picked up the straight stick wedged it in between, I think it was between the rock and the edge of the enclosure here, and bent it. So stuck it in, twisted it over, formed a hook of her own, and then proceeded to get the food out of the container, which they took as, okay, well, there's that intentionality, there's, you know, knowing what the correct tool is for the situation, and then creating it to use it to retrieve the food um, from the apparatus. All right. As much as I would love to talk more and more and more about tool use, we're actually going to move on and talk about spatial memory in food storing birds. So this area, as you might imagine, might kind of relate to some of the research that I have done myself because my research is on chickadees and chickadees happen to be a food storing species. So the idea of food storing, or more specifically called caching behavior, is probably an adaptation that's used to survive predictable food shortages. So a lot of species, a lot of bird species that live in the very north or very far south where they have four seasons and experience winter, a lot of these species that don't uh, migrate tend to have some kind of food storing ability or some other ability that allows them to obtain food during those months when their normal food sources are covered in snow. So uh, chickadees or uh, nutcrackers or nut hatches, they will all gather a bunch of food during the warmer months and cache it 
for retrieval during the winter months. So for so far, there are three groups that we have studied that uh, do this food storing behavior. Parids, which are our chickadees. Uh, titmice also fall under this category, so these kinds of guys. Uh, corvids, which include jays, crows, ravens, nutcrackers. Those all also display caching behaviors. And then cytids are our nuthatches, so red and white-breasted nuthatches. Um, those are both found in this area. Um, they all cache as well. Now, not all species within these groups display caching behavior, um, and those who do display caching behavior tend to have some special adaptations, some uh, traits that have evolved through evolution um, in relation to their ability to store food. So we can call this a neural specialization because we find that uh, even across all three of these groups, those species within the groups that do food catching behavior have larger hippocampuses or hippocampi uh, relative to their brain and body than non-storing birds, even if those non-storing birds are fairly closely related. So species that cache have larger hippocampuses as compared to the rest of their brain volume and compared to their body size um, when we compare them to similarly sized other species that don't cache. And there's a really cool example that even within a species, there can be differences in their ability to cache um, based on their ecological factors. So if we look at the same species of chickadee from Colorado versus Alaska, the Alaskan chickadees, the ones that live further north and would probably experience a harsher winter, actually performed better on a uh, well, they cached more when brought into the lab, and they performed better on spatial memory tasks, even if those spatial memory tasks weren't directly related to caching. So they just have better spatial memory abilities than the Colorado chickadees. Now, this isn't just something specific to the species because they're the same species. What we're saying is that the Colorado chickadees maybe hadn't had a selective pressure to develop these improved spatial memory abilities. And if they compared the two species on non-spatial learning tasks, if they have learning tasks that don't involve uh, navigation or remembering where things are, both species or both subspecies, both groups, I guess, performed equally well. So it's not that the Alaska chickadees are smarter. It's not that they're just, you know, better at remembering things. It's just that they are better at remembering things related to spatial cues. So the Alaska population was specifically adapted to find and remember where food had been stored, probably because of the harsher climate and the longer winters. Which, again, just very, very cool that you can see such a dramatic difference between two populations of the exact same species. Okay. Huh, again, I could talk about this quite a bit, but let's keep it moving. So let's talk briefly about why this feat of memory is remarkable. Why do we care that these birds can cache and store food to retrieve later? Well, the cool part is that these memories are formed very, very quickly. A bird tends to only visit, visit a single caching site once when they are caching, and they tend to do it very quickly. So they'll have, say, a sunflower seed in their beak. They'll find a good spot, they'll dig a hole, they'll cover it up with some moss in the area, and then they'll leave. So they're only exposed to those spatial cues very, very briefly, and then they leave very, very quickly. They also have a large number of items that must be remembered. In a lot of the studies that have looked at, so how many different caches do each of these birds make, some species cache in the range of up to 100,000 items each year. And they come back to quite a few of them because these birds have to eat multiple times a day all winter. So they're still going to be caching or retrieving the food that is cached in at least a few thousand of these. 
So they have to remember a massive, massive amount of information and be able to reliably, reliably find it or else they're not going to survive. And this information is retained over very long periods of time. Research in uh, research with the Clark's nutcrackers, which are sort of the optimal species for studying this because these guys uh, fall on the higher end of number of items cached each year, where it's nothing for them to cache 100,000 or more items every year. When researchers tested their ability to remember these locations, they were accurate even almost 300 days later. So their ability to store this information doesn't degrade rapidly over time. It, they can hold on to it for almost a year, if not longer. Um, that's just as long as experimentally uh, set up things have shown. Now, of course, to be a good researcher, you want to consider alternative explanations. Is it easier to assume that these birds have crazy accurate memories, that they can track thousands of different items after a brief, brief exposure and remember it for many, many days at a time? Or is it more likely that they're using some other simpler mechanism to find and retrieve those caches later? So in order to say that they're actually using memory, we have to rule out some alternative explanations. Some other explanations that have been proposed to explain these caching strategies have included things like randomly searching and happen, happening across different caches and then eating whatever they find. So if this was the case, the birds would then cache randomly in their area, and then when they're hungry, go start searching in random locations. The next proposed uh, option here is that these birds tend to store food in particular types of locations, and therefore when they're hungry, they would go looking in those locations. So they might think, again, anthropomorphically, they might think, hey, I tend to cache food in areas that have lots of moss on the ground next to these kinds of trees, so I'm going to go look in an area that has moss on the ground and has some of these trees. So that would be a little bit higher accuracy than just a totally random search. Um, but then it would re rely on these birds sort of still randomly searching, but only in a select subset of locations. Uh, the next potential possibility is that they somehow mark the food storage sites. Maybe they leave some kind of visual or olfactory cue that they can then use to find those caches later on. And then the last proposed option is that there are olfactory cues. So maybe the birds can smell the food that they've hidden and they use that to find it. Now, each of these possible strategies don't require the use of memory um, and are sort of simpler, I guess, as an explanation, which would go along with our whole parsimony idea where the simplest explanation is usually the best. So we would need to set up carefully controlled laboratory experiments where we could show that these are not what's going on. So we'd have to have very carefully controlled and manipulated situations where we can adjust, say, one or two different aspects at a time to determine if the birds are actually using one of these um, and go from there. So let's look at one of the experiments that was actually set up to try and do this. This was an experiment done by Camel and Balda down, uh, back in 1985. And these, uh, this experiment was done with Clark's Nutcrackers. So these guys, um, they're actually, uh, I believe this species is found in the air, well, not directly in our area, but if you head towards the mountains, you might be lucky enough to spot these guys every once in a while. But this species, uh, they live in alpine areas in the western coast or western area of North America. They tend to harvest seeds from pine cones and they, or, and they cache these little, uh, I guess, clusters of seeds. So three or four or five seeds at a time in a single cache. And they'll cache those towards the end of the summer, early autumn. And then in the winter, they'll come back and retrieve those caches. So for this experimental setup, we have this 
uh, search area. So we're, this is a top down view where we're looking down onto a board that has a bunch of holes drilled into it. So there are 180 holes in this board and the holes are filled with sand. So on the first day of the experiment, the experimenters would randomly select 18 holes that would be left uncovered. Um, the random bits and pieces and shapes that are on here would be different kinds of uh, debris or things that they were using as spatial cues just to see if that's what the uh, birds were using. We can kind of ignore that. Um, but they would cover up most of the holes, but they would leave 18 of them exposed. So when the nutcrackers were brought into the enclosure and given food, in this case we were using seeds, uh, the nutcrackers would cache their seeds in 18 of those 180 spots. They then removed the birds from that enclosure and held on to them for differing amounts of time. The first part of the experiment that we're looking at was a 10 day retention interval. Actually, I have this on the next slide. So after 10 days, they allowed the birds to return. And this time, the holes that had been previously covered were no longer covered which meant that the birds had 180 different locations that they could search to try and find that food. Now to try and control for some of the other possible things that might be happening from our list here, they wanted to see, okay, are the birds searching at random rates? Are they just searching like one hole at a time? Are they searching randomly? Are the birds finding the, the correct holes at uh, chan or at rates higher than chance. So are they doing better than the 18 out of 180 uh, chance that they would have had if they were just randomly searching? Um, we could also check were they storing in particular types of locations? Do they tend to search, um, uh, do they tend to search in a particular type of location? This one, uh, this can't be the case here because the birds were told where to cache because they only had those 18 options. Uh, for marking food storage sites, after the experiment, when, or, or after the stage where the birds had cached the food, the experimenters went in and removed the food and raked the sand flat. So there were no visual cues that also removed any olfactory cues because there was no food present. So they controlled for all of these different aspects, which is why this is such an amazing study. And what they did find was that even though they controlled for all of those different factors, the birds were performing at above chance levels. They were going to the 18 holes that had previously had food in them, and they mostly ignored the other holes. The experimenters have done numerous iterations of this experiment, and this is where we actually get that idea or that understanding that these nutcrackers can still be accurate at finding those 18 cache sites even after 285 days. So they must be using spatial cues, they must be relying on um, the orientation of things in their environment, and they can't be relying on any of the factors that people had proposed as alternative explanations. Which, again, so cool. So this tells us that the birds can know where they have cached things, and they can remember for long periods of time. But we might want to know, can they remember when they cached something? If they can remember for 285 days, well, maybe we need to know if they can remember, did I cache that this year or was it last year? Or was it the year before? Because maybe their food might have gone bad after all of that time. So we're going to introduce this idea of timing, which I think based on our timing in this lecture is probably going to replace our discussion of timing and numerosity, but that's okay. Um, we're going to introduce this aspect of time to talk about um, knowing where things have been cached, maybe also knowing what has been cached, and knowing when you cached it. And we're going to care about this because if you're caching multiple types of foods, some foods don't keep as well as others. So we're going to look at the example of birds that cache mealworms versus peanuts, where mealworms, their 
kind of caterpillary, but smaller if you don't know what they are. Um, they're basically a larval form of a beetle. Um, birds love them. They're high in protein. They're really, really attractive food sources. So that is a preferred food source, but they will degrade over time. Whereas peanuts, they're a pretty standard food source. The birds are okay with them, um, and they will not degrade over time because the nuts are pretty resilient and tend not to rot the way that a mealworm would. So if we introduce this aspect of some foods will degrade over time, we can evaluate what these birds know about timing or when something was cached. So we're going to adapt this paradigm of food caching and recovery in order to study episodic-like memory in birds. So for episodic memory, we're talking about the memory for a specific event or episode, our ability to remember something that has happened to us in our past. It's fairly simple to study episodic memory in humans because you can just ask them, hey, do you remember that time when X happened? And they can describe it to you. But in non-human animals, it's a lot harder. So this is why you'll usually see it called episodic-like memory, because we can't quite be certain that it is actually episodic as we think about it in terms of human research. But in order to call something episodic memory, we determine that it has to have three components. It has to have a what. You need to remember what was done. You need to remember where it was done. And you need to remember when it was done. So you need to remember all three aspects. The next specification is that these three W's need to be integrated, meaning that you use knowledge of all three of those things at once. And the last point is that the use of those three W's must be flexible, meaning that you can use it to solve problems other than those you encountered at the time that you are remembering. So this is all kind of abstract, but we're going to walk through again a really cool study that helps illustrate exactly what it is they were searching for in this definition of episodic-like memory in non-human animals. So we're going to look at scrub jays. So these fall under the family of corvids because all jays are corvids. As with most bird species, these jays prefer to eat worms over peanuts. So if given the choice, they would choose to eat and cache worms over peanuts when they're given that option. The experimental setup throughout this, uh, or this experiment here is going to be using these ice cube trays, kind of like our uh, setup here where we have the holes drilled filled with sand. These ice cube trays are filled with, I think it's just wood shavings, um, but they would give these jays these trays and allow them to cache whatever food they were given. And these look like mealworms, I think, but it's a really grainy picture, so it's hard to tell. Um, and these blocks are here not just to be fun, but because this distinctive arrangement of blocks would allow the birds to identify which tray they had previously cached in. So if they're caching mealworms in this tray, they might remember it based on the specific colors or the layout or the presence of individual uh, pieces here just so that they know how to tell them apart. And that'll be important because they'll be presented with multiple trays later on. Now, what they're looking at here is evidence for episodic-like memory in non-human animals. And this experiment is one of the best for illustrating this. Um, and it's nice and simple to explain, which is also lovely. So they were looking at what? Um, so they could examine what was cached by having two different types of food. So they can remember what, worms or peanuts. They can, rem uh, they can be asked where, where was important if you have a preference for these two different um, types of food. So if they have two distinctive trays, one tray for worms and one tray for peanuts, then they would go to their preferred type of food. So all things being equal, they would go and find a worm tray, if at all possible. Then we can introduce the aspect of when. When is important if you in, in 
uh, if you incorporate some type of deterioration. So I mentioned here that these worms will naturally degrade over time at a rate much faster than the peanuts. So if you had birds that were caching worms versus peanuts and the worms would go bad over time, if you waited a long time, the birds shouldn't then go after the worms because they would have rotted. And that's the whole logic of this experiment. So they had two conditions, a degrade condition and a replenish condition. We're going to start with our degrade condition. And so the way that this is set up is at the top here, we have our training set up. So they would be given worms and then peanuts or peanuts and then worms. Um, this is just to control so that there's no interference of order. So they would be given worms in one location and be allowed to cache worms in one tray. And then they'd be given or and then that worm tray would be taken away. And then they'd be given peanuts and a new tray that they could cache peanuts in. Or they could do it the other way around, peanuts first and then worms. As I said, just controlling for order. And then they had two groups, one group that was tested after four hours and one group that was tested after 124 hours. So a long, long time later. And uh, they would be given both trays at once. They'd be given the worm tray and the peanut tray together. And remember, they look distinctive because of the colored blocks that were there. So they know which tray is which, theoretically. And the idea here is that if they searched after four hours, the worms and the peanuts would both still be there and still be in edible condition. So we would predict that after four hours, these birds should search in the worm, uh, in the worm tray the most. So if we look at the bottom here, we have at our four hour trial, um, so we have our two different trials. Each bar is a different type of tray that they were searching in, nuts or worms. And this is just the mean number of searches. So a higher score here means that they looked in that tray more. And so we're seeing that they spent a lot more time on the worm tray than the nut tray after four hours. However, after 124 hours, the worms were removed and replaced with rotten worms, worms that weren't fit for eating. And very quickly, when the birds were tested, after 124 hours, very few of them went for worms, and most of them went for nuts. Now, it's important to note here that they did the same thing with the previous experiment, where in the testing phase, um, when they brought back the trays after this association had been learned, they did it with fresh uh fresh dirt or fresh sawdust and no food items present just to make sure that they weren't just doing odor cues or whatever. Um, but yeah, we already covered the controls, so we're just kind of hand-waving that part. To make sure that it wasn't just something to do with the amount of time that had passed and something, uh, some other random weird factor where maybe they had forgotten about the worms over time, but not the peanuts. They did the same thing, but during the training stage, they replaced the original worms with fresh worms. So there's no degradation here. So this is the replenish condition. And in this replenish condition, everything is identical except that the worms didn't rot. And we see that the birds preferred to search for worms at 24 hours and 124 hours because they prefer worms. So as long as the worms don't rot, they're still going to go and search for worms. And there's another sort of hand wavy thing that we're going to talk about here where they wanted to make sure that there wasn't anything else weird going on. And they did a, a an iteration of this where after four hours, the worms had rotted, but after 24 or after 124, they hadn't. And the birds then learned to have peanuts after four hours and worms after the longer period of time. So they're learning that timing, not just some weird association with worms and time. Um, so a phenomenal experiment that helps illustrate that these birds know what, where, when uh, for these worms or for this setup. So as our summary, all groups searched for worms more than peanuts after four hours if the worms were still whole. Um, the deterioration group searched for more for peanuts than for worms after the long period of time. The replenished group continued to just go for worms after the long period of time. So the birds remembered what they had cached, peanuts 
or worms, where they had cached it, which tray has the worms and which tray has the peanuts, and when they cached it, because um, they adjusted their behavior based on how much time had elapsed. And there's some technicalities of maybe not specifically when, but they do remember how long ago, and that seems to be sufficient for some people. Okay, so next we are going to talk about perceptual categories, and specifically forming and using perceptual categories. So we can talk about categorization and concept learning, and we're going to find very, very quickly that this is actually fairly similar to something that we've already talked quite a bit about. So, for example, back in chapter 8, we talked about stimulus equivalence training, where you would generalize your responding from one thing to multiple things that were fairly similar to the first thing. So, that's closely related to categories. So, the idea here is that natural stimuli never occur the same way twice. You can see a cloud and then look in a different part of the sky and see a different shape, but you know that it is still a cloud. So you've formed a category that all of those fluffy white things in the sky are clouds, even though they don't look identical. So you have generalized your label of a cloud to include a whole category of things that all count as clouds. So if we're looking at how we perceive these different categories, we can look at specifically at category perception. And we can focus on how we form these categories, how we use these categories, and all sorts of things using a bunch of different experimental setups. So let's look very, very briefly at an example of stimulus equivalence training. So here we have a subset of images that are being shown. And so maybe we want to teach someone or something like, say, a pigeon, uh, a particular category. So this is set up to teach pigeons to recognize trees versus non-trees. And so the stuff that's labeled with a plus on this side have trees in it. So there's a tree here. There's trees up here. This is not trees. It has very similar qualities, but it's actually sort of dry and caked mud, I believe. Um, and then this here is a sprig of celery. So these are non-trees and these are trees. So we could use stimulus equivalence training to encourage uh, pigeons to learn that these and things like this are trees and things uh, these and other things like these are non-trees. So let's look at how that works. We've talked previously about the ideas of generalization and discrimination, and these can relate to how we decide to put things into categories. So if we are generalizing, we are treating things as fitting within the same category. So my example with clouds, two clouds can look very different, but I can call them both clouds. So I have generalized and called both of them clouds. If I want to discriminate, I want to make a distinction between two categories. Maybe I look at a vapor trail that's following a plane, and I know that that isn't quite a cloud. It's very similar, it's white and it's up in the sky, but it had a different source and it's in a straight line, so it's not quite a cloud. So I have now discriminated between clouds and vapor trails. So I'm discriminating between those two categories. So let's do a visual representation of how categorization works. We're going to be using two different categories. We have butterflies and we have dogs here. So butterflies all fit in the blue rectangle on the left and dogs fit in the one on the right. So if you're trained with these butterflies and these dogs, if you saw another blue butterfly with wings like this, you'd say, yeah, it's a butterfly. And if you saw another dog with sort of black uh, on, the, on the back and then the white on the tummy, you'd be like, yeah, also a dog. But then what if we introduce new exemplars? What if we have novel stimuli, something you haven't seen before? Well, hopefully, you might have learned that these butterflies are more than just 
this specific pattern or this specific pattern or this specific pattern, maybe you'd say, okay, things with wings shaped kind of like that with the antennae and the body in the middle, that's probably a butterfly. And this new image fits some of those characteristics. So yeah, I'm going to call that a butterfly. And you might look at the dog and say, yes, this has the same vague shape. It sits the same way as these guys. It has the nose and the mouth and some ears. That could be a dog. So we have successfully sorted those new stimuli into our categories. And we use this exact same idea in a lot of operant conditioning setups where we're studying categories. Um, so I think I've talked about this example looking at category formation with black cap chickadees before using our go no go paradigm. Um, so we're going to do it again, just explaining our logic here for categories. So if we wanted to use a conditioning setup and we wanted to say uh, help a particular organism form a category for butterflies versus dogs. So we could say that butterflies are going to be one category. And any time you see a butterfly, if you make a response, if you're a chickadee and you fly to the feeder, you get food. If you're a pigeon in a box and you peck the key under the butterfly picture, you get food. If you're a rat in a box and press the lever next to the butterfly, you get food. So we would call the butterfly category our S plus or rewarded category. And because we want them to know that dogs are different, whenever they see a dog, it would be an S minus or unrewarded category. This means that if the chickadee flew to the feeder after seeing a dog, they wouldn't get food. If a pigeon pecks the key next to the dog, they don't get food. The rat pulls the lever under the dog, they don't get food. So in this way, they learn that butterflies are rewarded, dogs are unrewarded. And so we're encouraging them to learn that all things that kind of look like this are good and get them food, and things that look like this are bad and don't get them food. And again, I'm oversimplifying and anthropomorphizing a bit, but just to try and help us understand the concept here. And so this setup encourages uh, category formation because instead of having to remember this specific wing pattern and this specific wing pattern and this specific pattern and this pattern and that pattern. You could just learn that things that have wings shaped like that and bodies in the middle and antennae, they're all butterflies. That rule is a lot simpler and it applies to everything in the category. With dogs, you could say, you know, four legs, tail, ears, and a face. Cool, it's a dog. Those rules would apply to the whole category, and you don't have to remember each individual dog that you've seen. We can then uh, sort of manipulate this in our experiments by introducing what's called a pseudo-category. So these were true categories where the S plus group, the rewarded group, was all one category. They all fell under one rule. And the S minus group was all one category, fell under one rule. And of course, we would have controls where you switch them, where some would be rewarded for dogs and not butterflies, but for simplicity's sake. All right, so in our pseudo category group, we remove that category ability. Now there isn't a single rule that applies to everything that you're being rewarded for. So here you're being rewarded for these three butterflies and these three dogs but there isn't a general rule that you can use to remember this category, which is why we're calling it a pseudo category because it's not really a category. It's just a group that we now have to memorize in order to remember what we get food for. Because our unrewarded category is a different butterfly, uh, a different set of butterflies and a different set of dogs. So we have to remember this butterfly gets you food, this one doesn't. This dog gets you food and this one doesn't. So you have to memorize and rely on rote memorization to remember which ones get you food and which ones don't. So in an experiment, you would train up multiple groups. Some are true category groups where they can learn a category and just use that basic rule to learn the discrimination. Some would get a pseudo category and they have to memorize each instance in order to get the food. 
Then what we could do in addition to that is test for generalization. So generalization to novel exemplars, which is kind of like what happened here where we were introduced to new uh, stimuli, a new butterfly and a new dog. And you have to decide, is it something that gets you food and you should push the button or go to the feeder or pull the lever? Or is it a new dog and you shouldn't do any of that? And you should also note that in a true category group, yeah, new butterfly means go to the feeder. New dog means don't. In a pseudo category group, you wouldn't know what to do with it because some butterflies get you food and some don't. So we should see a difference in responding where individuals in the two group in the true groups know what to do with new stimuli and the ones in the pseudo groups don't know what to do with the new stimuli and so if we can see that novel uh that novel stimulus being sorted properly we can call that transfer of performance it means that the organism learned something during training and has transferred or carried over that training into our testing. And if they're doing that, it rules out rote memorization. They can't use rote memorization. They would have had to have used a general rule that applied to the whole category. So if we see this kind of performance in a true group where they were able to categorize something they'd never seen before, we can say they weren't relying on rote memorization and they must have treated these stimuli as the same category and therefore must have had some kind of rule that applied to everything that fit within that category. So this evidence of generalization to novel exemplars is critical for demonstrations of perceptual concept learning because it's telling us that there must have been some kind of concept, there must have been some kind of category and rule that allowed them to make that choice. Okay, so let's look at a chickadee example again, of course. So for this experiment, instead of using butterflies versus dogs, we're gonna be using auditory stimuli. And this is a study that was done in the lab that I did my research in, in Dr. Sturdy's lab. Um, but this was done by Bloomfield, Farrell, and Sturdy back in 28, or 2008. Ooh. All right, so they're looking at black cap chickadees. These guys over here, they sound like this. Um, and so this is what their vocalization looks like. This is a spectrogram, so frequency on this axis by time. It's just a visual representation of what their vocalizations sound like. Um, and then the other group would be our mountain chickadees. They sound like this. And that's what a spectrogram of their vocalization looks like. So they sound fairly distinct. And we wanted to ask is, do these chickadees have the ability to discriminate between black cap chickadee calls and mountain chickadee calls? And do they form distinct perceptual categories for each of those types of calls? Basically asking, are they able to use true groups uh, or are they able, if given true groups, to form a category and treat novel stimuli vocalizations they haven't heard before as either black cap or mountain chickadees, um, or are they relying on rote memorization? And we're going to use the same exact setup that we just looked at with our dogs and butterflies, where we have a true group where some are reinforced or um, given food for responding to black cap chickadee calls and not reinforced or not given food for responding to mountain chickadee calls. We would also obviously do the opposite. And then we'd have pseudo groups where they would be reinforced or given food for certain mountain chickadee calls and certain black cap chickadee calls, but not others. So our true groups are shown here with our dots and the pseudo groups are shown with the triangles. And so our graph here is looking at our discrimination ratio. So how good are they at telling mountain chickadee calls, sorry, mountain chickadee calls from black cap chickadee calls, a higher of a discrimination ratio, the better they're doing. 50% or 0.5 here is chance levels. So they would just be responding kind of equally to both. And this is uh, our timing across the bottom, just for number of trials. And so we can see that our pseudo category group here 
is staying pretty close to 50%. So they seem to be like, they kind of figure out the ones that they're trained on, but they don't learn anything new. Whereas very, very quickly, um, as soon as a thousand trials, which would be like a day for these chickadees in, in some of our setups, they're learning definitely to respond more to what they're being reinforced for and to respond less to what they're not being reinforced for. So we're seeing a much faster learning. They're able to form these categories. They're able to use these rules. And our uh, pseudo category groups are absolutely not. So you might be asking yourself, how are they doing this discrimination? So what mechanism is driving this? There's a bunch of conflicting ideas. Um, I've kind of used the idea of the feature theory, saying that members of a category have a common feature. So when I was talking about butterflies have wings and a body in the middle and some antennae, those are all features that are consistent between the different members of that category. We can have a polymorphic rule where there are usually multiple features that are used to determine if something fits into a category. The more features that you have in common with that category, the more likely you are to put that item into that category. And we can also, uh, the textbook talks briefly about higher level concepts. You can discriminate between things that are natural versus artificial. This is a really cool one that uh, there's been a lot of work with pigeons doing stuff like this. If you ever want to waste an afternoon, I would recommend checking out uh, Dr. Bob Cook or Robert Cook. He has done a ton of different really interesting discriminations with pigeons and they're great at telling apart different categories. Can also do more abstract concepts like uh, is this the same or different? Um, those Again, we could spend forever talking about them, but um, with enough training, you can get same different discriminations among different species, which is kind of cool. And that same different could relate a little bit back to our delayed matching to sample discussions from the last chapter. Um, just off the hand or uh, an off the cuff note. All right. We need to keep moving though. As I said, we're a little bit tight on time. So we're going to talk next about language learning. And language is another one of those very, very, very um, contentious topics where there are people on both sides where they think that there uh, are some language equivalents within animal communication and specifically non-human animal communication. And there are some who believe that uh, language is a human specific phenomena. And there are people who kind of fall somewhere in the middle. Um, so we're going to kind of take a little bit of a middle route um, because we're talking about comparative cognition. So, of course, we want to look at how close do other animals come to the levels of language and communication that humans do. So people tend to agree on the fact that language is one of the most important intellectual capacities possessed by humans, because language is what allows us to live in large social groups. It's what allows us to teach skills and information, to pass on information between generations. Imagine, without language, we wouldn't be able to benefit from previous studies. We would have to learn everything ourselves from scratch if we couldn't receive that knowledge from others within our species. Language is also a way to express things that aren't easy to express, things like feelings and thoughts, internal aspects. Um, language allows us to vocalize those, verbalize them, and share them with others. So how do we describe language? How do we talk about language? How do we define it? Um, in most language literature, you're going to find that they'll open up their discussion with their definition of language. As I said, not everyone agrees on what they're going to call language. We're just going to talk about some of the most commonly agreed upon aspects. So language is more than just communication. There's also going to be factors that need to be included, things like symbolic meaning. So if you look at the word uh, language, there's nothing in the shape of that word, in the letters that make it up, that makes us think about language. It is a symbol that we have come to associate with the concept of language. Language should also have some kind of concept of semantics or meaning. 
there are rules for how we connect different symbols to what they mean or represent. Language also has grammar and syntax, both of which refer to rules in how we order all of the different components of language. And usually within language, there is some sort of critical period. So with humans, we tend to learn to speak when we are fairly young. From a very young age, we start with babbling and basic imitation, making up syllables, stringing syllables together, saying individual words, then strings of words, then proper sentences, and so on and so forth. For humans who were, say, raised in isolation, where they weren't exposed to language, once they've exited this critical period, then they no longer have that ability to learn language the same way that they would have if they had learned it during a critical period. And this critical period also applies to other species. Um, birds are a phenomenal example of very close uh, equivalence to language, where they have a critical period. I will talk very briefly about black-capped chickadees because they have some sort of ordering to some of the notes in their vocalizations. Um, so many more things, but we're going to talk about um, language abilities and some of the other species and how we've kind of tried to teach languages to other species. Much of language research in non-human species has focused on our closest relative, the great apes. So there have been tons of attempts to try and teach orangutans, chimps, and gorillas to speak English. And of course, most of these have failed spectacularly. And most of these failures actually come from a physiological problem where our vocal tracts are very, very different, where they don't have the same ability to form as precise uh, enunciations that we do. So when we say that uh, the great apes can't acquire language or vocal language, we're not necessarily sure if it's an intellectual um, inability or if it's more of just a physical impossibility. And so after they figured this out, there was a shift to try and use things like artificial languages that didn't rely on verbal communication. So there has been, again, tons and tons and tons of research into this, and you could go down a YouTube rabbit hole like I have um, and look at some of the different uh, experiments and different studies that have gone on. And most of these studies have gone on for years, if not decades. Um, and so there's been lots of attempts and successes at teaching different great apes American Sign Language. So there's a lot of instances where they can learn sort of single gestures. Um, in sign language, they're called uh, chirim, chirims. Uh, if you were speaking, it would be called a phoneme, which is just sort of like a single syllable that you can say. So these chirims are single gestures, and there's been a number of different, um, these are names of specific apes that have been able to learn um, these different phonemes or gestural equivalents. So Washo, Nim, and Lulis are three different chimps. They know for sure that Washo has uh, 180 different gestures that they've learned, Nim 125. Um, I couldn't find any descriptor for Lolis. But they would test this by, say, giving a gesture and asking for an apple. And then if the ape passed them an apple, they would say that they understood what was asked of them. And there are some fascinating stories of um, sort of how this use of sign language evolved and changed, where they were originally just taught individual signs, but then they started finding that the uh, the apes were spontaneously combining signs to um, sort of almost mimic sentence production, where they would talk about uh, a bird in the water. They would uh, sign water and bird, and maybe there was a duck nearby me. Or, or things like that. Um, and they even expressed things as abstract as grief when one of them had a, one of their offspring pass away. And the really cool relationship here is that Lulis was actually um, taken in 
at 10 months old and was adopted and raised by Washo. Um, and so the signs that Lulis knows didn't come directly just from humans, but also from interacting with and learning from the uh, his, I believe it's a him, um, his adoptive mother. So this is something that's showing being passed on through uh, different generations, which is so cool. Um, okay, I have to move on again. Um, there's also been uh, artificial languages based around plastic tokens, where the tokens would uh, vary in shape, size, color, and texture, and they could be associated with different meanings. So you could pass along a token, and that token means uh, one type of food versus another. Um, and there seems to be some kind of comprehension that way. We can have lexigrams over here. Um, this is, again, mostly just in great apes. Um, but these lexigrams are symbols. So this is a whole bunch of different symbols, and these symbols would serve as words. So to communicate with an ape who knew how to use these symbols, they merely had to point or gesture to each of the symbols. And so they could say point to the sign that means water, and they could uh, point to the sign that means uh, food to say that they wanted a meal or something like that. And there was even some evidence of them understanding spoken English, where you could talk to them and have them um, sort of imitate what you told them to do. And this one is very interesting because this individual, Kanzi, was able to understand spoken English that was talking about doing something sort of in a displaced location. So they were told, take the potato outdoors, and they knew that they were being asked to do something elsewhere. So they picked up the potato and went with it. Um, so that displacement is very interesting because that's one of those uh, proposed as specific to humans kind of aspects of language, but not quite. Uh, so yeah, lots and lots of interesting things with these artificial languages. So as I said, that's mostly done with great apes. There has been more recent uh, efforts to look at language abilities in other species. So dogs, parrots, and dolphins are another growing field. Uh, maybe you've seen some of the videos going around lately with dogs who are communicating with their owners by pushing buttons that speak words. Um, that's a very, very interesting uh, new development. Um, there's, of course, the fact that dogs can respond to spoken commands. They can sometimes follow visual cues. You might be able to train a dog to follow a point or a gesture. Um, all sorts of different things that dogs can do. Parrots are absolutely amazing. I recently, at, this, uh, at the conference I was attending virtually, there was a speaker, uh, uh, Dr. Pepperberg, who had worked with Alex the parrot, and she was talking about asking Alex about different colors and even numbers, and his ability to count, and um, if she asked for something that was blue, he could point to something that was blue, and things like that. Um, I would absolutely love to spend time on her research, but all I can do is point you in the right direction, and maybe you're interested in that as well. Um, dolphins are another amazing group that have been showing a lot of promise lately, and they tend to be skipped over in a lot of the literature. There have been lots and lots of studies using um, like button boards in the water. Um, so there are boards that have different buttons on them, and then the dolphin can push those buttons and it'll say certain things or it'll mean certain things, and they can ask for different items. They tend to mostly ask for food. Um, but they found that some dolphins would ask for one type of food over another, and they would change based on what they were preferring or what they wanted that day. Um, so that's, you know, kind of language-esque. Um, and of course, dolphins uh, work with trainers and respond to both vocal and um, visual stimuli. So if the trainer uses different gestures, they know what they mean and can do the uh, tricks that are being asked of them. So there is some ongoing, well, some, lots and lots of ongoing research into sort of pseudo-languages or proto-languages um, in other species. But what seems to separate these proto-languages from what we might call true language with humans is that we have issues with grammar. Um, so even though a lot of these 
individuals have shown the ability to string words together. There isn't any predictable grammar to it. There isn't necessarily any set order in how things are presented. There aren't rules in how things are combined. It's also very difficult to analyze because most of these studies are being done on one or two individuals at a time. So it's almost impossible to make any broad sweeping statement of what this species can do as a whole. There's problems with definitions. As I said early on, not everyone agrees on what the definition of language should include, and if they can't uh, agree on a definition, they can't agree on whether species meet that definition or not. Um, and there is no evidence for complex sentences yet. And as I hinted at early on, songbird vocalization learning seems to be our closest equivalent to human language learning. So I've done quite a bit of research with black capped chickadees, and I have actually been looking at their preference for order within their own vocalizations. They always produce their vocalizations in the same order, but there's a lot of variability where they can include different numbers of different notes, and they can have different quantities of those notes, and they can leave some of the notes out, but they still always occur under the same order hierarchy, which is really, really cool. And as I mentioned, songbirds have that critical period where if they don't learn to sing or call during that period, they can't call normally and all sorts of other things like that. So um, future research in songbirds might help us understand a little bit more about how humans learn and acquire their language. Um, but we do need to keep in mind that, you know, with comparative cognition, it is always just finding maybe some common ground or if you're me being interested in songbirds for the sake of songbirds. All right, uh, as I mentioned, I had hoped to touch on timing and numerosity, but we are absolutely going to be out of time, so I will skip that over. Um, it's a really cool section of the textbook if you wanted to glance at it, but I won't ask timing specific questions for our exam, just because we didn't have the time to go over it in person, or I guess in video form. And I guess a lovely place to leave our discussion of comparative cognition, our discussion of principles of learning, and this course would be with a quote from Charles Darwin that says, Nevertheless, the difference in mind between man and the higher animals, great as it is, certainly is one of degree and not kind. So as much as people have always wanted to say that something is entirely unique to humans, it's specific to humans, it's special and only ever seen in humans, the more research that we're doing, the more studies that we're running, the more uh, questions that we're asking, we're finding that humans may not be as completely unique as they seem. And though, yes, they might be the only ones with the kind of language ability that we're seeing, we're also finding that there are animal species that come close, at least in uh, degree, to what the human mind is capable of. So I'm super excited to see where the field goes in the future, and I hope that this very brief summary of what comparative cognition can look at has maybe piqued your interest and uh, maybe made you interested in what's going on in the field as well.